Welcome and thank you for joining me on the Listen by Heart podcast. I'm your host, Jasmine Lowe. The origins of this podcast can be traced back to a project titled Listen to Your Heart, a TEDx talk I gave at the Multimedia University in Cyberjaya, also known as TEDx MMU. And the initial idea was a deep dive into frequencies and vibrational healing, something I was very passionate about as my mother had just survived a non-malignant brain tumor operation and a part of her healing process involved speaking about what she would remember. One of the first things she said to me was, Jasmine, go downstairs and buy a coconut for me. Mom chatted to me about her life as a schoolgirl, a teacher, and it was a great way for her to talk about her life. It also became a storytelling session where I started to understand who I was. Welcome to season six of the Listen by Heart podcast, where we feature stories from women of the South China Sea. I'm your host, Jasmine Lowe, and on this audio journey, we welcome Su Lin Tan. I first met her in Sydney when she had just left her post at the Australian Financial Review, and she's now with the South China Morning Post. She has 25 years of business experience is a qualified accountant, and was once an investment banker and analyst. As a journalist, Sulin reports on business and financial news, housing and commercial property, street talk and investigations, as well as trade and conflicts, and the macro economy. So, hi, Sulin, how are you? Hi, great. Good, how are you? I'm good. You're, you're back in Sydney? At the moment, yes, yes. Um, and you were you were actually having a little stint outside of uh, Australia. Yes, I did. I I left Australia huh, at the start of the pandemic, which was one of the worst times to be overseas. Um, and I've been there since early twenty. I've been overseas since early twenty twenty, and it's been three years. So yeah. A long time. So were you in lockdown situations by any chance? Uh, it was uh, Hong Kong. I was in Hong Kong and Hong Kong was tricky, very tricky. Um, mm-hmm. We didn't have lockdowns per se, but definitely there were a lot of curfews and restrictions, you know, over f- five or six rounds. So, you know, it was quite difficult having a normal life. Um, but again, we're all in the same boat globally. So, yeah. And you headed back to Australia earlier this year? Um, so, yes, I did. I left Hong Kong and then I moved to Singapore um, because it was time to go, I guess, after being trapped there for two over two years. And, yeah, and then I've, I'm, I'm just currently back on a small break to see friends and family. So, yeah, but I'll be back in Singapore. That's where I am at the moment. I mean, Australia always likes to think that it's, you know, at the heart of Asia Pacific. Mm. Um, I remember going to university and those words, Australasia, came into (laughs) my vocab. Um, (laughs) you've, You've been, you know, you've pretty much spent half your life in Australia and probably quite a lot of it outside of Australia. Mm. Do you have anything to share on this? Um, I, I, on the other hand, don't think that Australia thinks it's at the centre of Asia Pacific. I think it, it likes to own a bit of that identity, but I think for the longest time, as far as I have been in Australia, I feel that it never was and never really is at the moment part of that, you know, um, well, it is Asia Pacific geographically, but it's not in Asia, if that makes any sense. Um, so is it at the centre? No, it's kind of at the bottom of the region, really. Um, so geographically, it's not at the centre. Um, so, yeah, I think it's at the fringes of, of the region, really, and I think it has a lot to do to get into the centre of the region, personally speaking. But, um, of course, people have different views about that. Uh, I, I like to say... Australia is on the south side of the South China Sea. <laughs> yes, it is. 
<laughs> it certainly is on the south side. Um, center, not quite. So, yeah, I, 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 and now being outside of Australia, I realize actually how um, it is Asia Pacific because it is in the region, but it is not quite in the center of it. The, the the other countries that are in Asia Pacific are very much at, at the center of it. Southeast Asia, for example, or the ASEAN countries, they're very much at the center of it. And there's so much activity there that isn't that is very isn't isn't similar to Australia. In fact, very different. The rest of Asia Pacific is very different to Asia or sorry, to Australia or Australasia, um, being, you know, Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific Islands. So yeah. I guess, to do, how do we define Asia Pacific? I think that's a very tricky one. Um, certainly, there are two worlds um, at play here. I think when um, when you look at a lot of multinationals, a lot of them do say that their Asia Pacific or regional headquarters for Asia are based in Australia, mm. and I always find that really fascinating from a economics <laughs> gateway point of view <laughs> yeah I, I i think i think australians need to realize that asia pacific is um a lot larger than just australia if that makes any sense there's almost a certain sort of um oblivion oblivion here when you know australians think that they are um at the center of the region um, because um, that's not quite true. Um, the rest of Asia is extraordinarily large and extraordinarily varied and diverse. And they, the thing is, the center of the world and the real headquarters of the world are actually in Asia. And for that matter, that can be, are we talking about Asia Pacific? It, it really is sort of, you know, from South Korea, Taiwan, I suppose you could say that's North Asia, um, but the Indochina area, Southeast Asia, um, and also, and then stretching down to to to, to Australia. But really, that region in the centre, the Southeast Asian region, that's the that I feel, you know, is is the heart of Asia Pacific. Mainly, a the population's there, so uh, that 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 is where the you know the activity is. And then the economic and social cultural vibrance is there as well. So, and and, and all of them are locked in together because they're so close to each other. So that 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 really is like a like the beating heart of Asia Pacific. But then again, you know, some people would disagree with me. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so then you were based um, in Hong Kong, which is a former, um, well, an emancipated island um, that has now been returned to China contentiously in 1999. Mm -hmm. I still remember it very well because I was just at university and I think um, it could be the case for you as well. Uh, you were in university around that time in the 90s? Yes, I was, yeah. And um, very vivid images of China during that time would be the Tiananmen uh, Square Massacre. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I was wondering what life was like for you as a university student in Australia. Yeah, look, um, it was a very extraordinary experience. And I, I, I came here as a teen and then I went to school and I went to university because of these years were the earlier years of my time in Australia. They were very, um, very raw, I suppose, um, well, firstly, it's an Anglo-Saxon country, so it's very different to Asia or Malaysia where I was born and Singapore where I schooled. Um, so there was a lot of adjustment to the language. You know, we speak English, but we don't really speak the same English. Um, there's also, you know, um, cultural differences, attitudes, and also racism, I suppose. At the time, in the 90s, I think there's... I think racism is used very loosely, but more um, ignorance, uh, a non a knowledge about you know Asian immigrants at the time, and of course, you know in the in the eighties and nineties when they when we all when it all first started, you know it was also very new. You know the Vietnamese boat people had just arrived, and then there was an influx of Malaysians and Singaporeans. 
And so it was a very raw time because it, it was lonely because, you know, the life that you knew isn't there. And, and it's a lot less dense in Australia compared to Malaysia and Singapore. So it feels very sparse and, you know, you're not connected with the world. Did that give you the room to grow as a writer? Because you were internalizing a lot of things at that time, possibly? Could that be? <laughs> you know, I always say as a journal, I don't have I don't have a novel in me. I, I I don't want to write anything, you know, in long form, as in, so I don't have a book to write. Um, but I think it gives me um it gave me a sense of storytelling. It gave me a sense of an ability to to tell stories and stories not just any story, but stories that are about the truth and facts and unknown, you know, inf- pieces of information. Um, because there's so much about Australian immigrants that people don't know. And and I think that's that that does give me this that that want to tell what really is. I find it really funny actually this um, year in particular when we were celebrating um, Australia Day, um, mm. I thought about Sorry Day, of course. Yes. And also about the fact that Australia is still under the crown. Yes, yes. And as a Southeast Asian from a country that was uh, declaring its freedom in 1957, yes. and from that region where you have, in that same month in August, Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia celebrating Independence Days. Yeah, and yet yeah. in Australia, there's no such thing. I I found that so farcical. Farcical. Yeah, I I think <laughs> it's so funny, so ironic. I was just talking to my partner about that just yesterday. We were just <laughs> thinking about Australia Day and thinking, what what is Australia Day? I mean, and 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 why are we celebrating Australia Day? Because as you said, in other countries. Their national day celebrates a moment in history, a, a very poignant moment of independence and self-establishment, a real declaration of of of, of um, independence. Whereas Australia Day is what the first day that Westerners came to Australia. I don't really, you know what I mean. Like it's, I don't think that's a day I want to celebrate as. I would call Australia Day the first day that Anglo-Saxons stepped on the shores of Australia. I mean, it doesn't really mean anything. Is it discovered then? No, because the Aboriginals have been here for thousands of years. So is it discovered? No. Is it independent? No. Is it separated from someone else? Not really. So you're right. It is quite a bizarre day to actually call Australia Day. I, I really hope as a as a new migrant, I mean I'm I'm not a new migrant. I, I can't even consider myself as a migrant. <laughs> I, yes. I just feel like I'm a transient being in Australia. Mm. And I've watched it from the 80s, celebrating mm. its bicentennial, 200 years of, you know, I can't even imagine how it would be for someone of uh, First Nations to 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 think about that day. And as an Asian or what they call us immigrant uh, or as a Southeast Asian, wherever we go, I don't, I don't belong anyway. Um, because everyone's trying to tell me to go back to China, but I don't belong there either. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering if you feel this predicament. Always, all the time. I even started to pretend I'm other from other countries when people ask me where I'm from in Australia. You know, I go to a pub and they say, you from Thailand? I said, no. Why would I be from Thailand? Or where are you from? The where are you from question really bothers me a lot. You know, the first instinct is to look at a person and go, you must be foreign. You must be another kind of person. You are the others. That, and as long as you're not blonde or white, then you're not Australian. That is, that is quite remarkable given that we're an immigrant country. And it's such a complex problem for all of us. And that's why if you're not, you're not assumed to be a person from that place, you started, as you said, you start uh, d- developing these sort of transient feelings and you become quite loose and you become not really f- as though you're part of this place when when you truly are, your passport says that. 
And so you start to wonder where you really belong. And that can be a very pro big problem for the social fabric of Australia. If it wants its people to be together, it needs to, from the top, really empower people to, to really accept everybody as Australians. Assume them first as Australians and then as, you know, conversation and develops to explore their, their background and so on and so forth. You know, you don't go up to a, a, an Anglo-Saxon person in Australia and go, oh, sorry, where are you from, Scotland? You don't really do that. So that's farcical, actually, in my mind. And it still is the case after so many years of immigration. It's almost it's stuck in time. It doesn't really understand its immigrant identity or position. And for that matter, you know, as an immigrant, I really would have liked to, have, you know, I was telling my partner yesterday that I really would have liked to be more knowledgeable about Aboriginal stories. I really like to receive my citizenship from an Aboriginal leader, for example. I would have liked to have learned more about Indigenous history and, you know, the dreaming and, and all those things that were, are actually very Australian. And that really isn't the case. And... That, I think, would have been a great way to identify Australia and for them to welcome all its immigrants as Australians, first and foremost, and nothing else. Um, so you're right. I think it's a bit of a problem, but I don't know if, you know, all Australians see it that way. Uh, certainly for, for me as an immigrant, I share your feelings. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I think it's a great idea what you just proposed. Hmm. Um, I, I certainly feel that with strongly, and more so now as I get older, I'm starting to read more about Aboriginal stories and trying, you know, understand the land that I'm on, you know, what that all means. It's it's really hard because, you know, I was telling my partner too, you know, streets on 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 uh, in Australia need to have the names of the streets and then the land where they're on, so that people are fully exposed to the idea that it's we're on Aboriginal land. And we know what Aboriginal land we're on. We need to be able to identify where the elders are. And, and we and, and on Australia Day, we should be able to go and, and learn these things. There should be more of that, more, more exposed, more public. Yeah, even more positively, you know, to really learn its history and be, be so in your face about it. It's like we're so in the face about beaches and pubs. Why couldn't we be more in your face about Aboriginal stories and history and knowledge and and cultures. So if it takes yeah. immigrants in parliament to do this, let's make it happen. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, and, and we've got know, representation now. <laughs> you know, it's really remarkable that it's 2020, well, it was 2022 last year when the election happened, but that was when they were starting to celebrate more diverse representation in parliament. I find that remarkable. That a country, an immigrant country is for the first time saying, oh, my God, look at this representation. It's the best we've ever had. I'm thinking, what? That is, that is sorry. <laughs> that is a big sorry, actually. Um, you know, Celine, so we, we haven't got that in the media. And you are one of our, how would you say, guiding lights. Yeah. I wouldn't say to a lot of people I'm not. I'm a, I, I'll be honest. I'm an outsider. Um, I'm, you know, it's like a club. There is a central narrative and there are journals who are part of that narrative. They're in that club. They all believe the same things. You know, a lot of them aren't, I mean, this is not a, a criticism, but, you know, a lot of them, you know, they're not data or evidence driven. They, they're very much straight out of J school and they, they belong to that club and, and that's okay. But everyone else who thinks differently or behaves differently or does their journalism differently are considered outside. So it, it's a very difficult um, place to be, to be on your own. And you're fighting a very a tough battle when you try and do stories that are different because, like everything else, journalism, well, you can talk about it being independent. And, oh, it's great, tells the truth and seeks justice. But a lot of it is very political as well. So it's tough being a uh, I, I think being someone, I, I, an Australian journalist who has a different way of doing things, you know, it's very different. If, you, if you're not fully Aussie um, and you believe the same things or say political vibes, etc., then it can be a bit challenging. What's your earliest memory as a child? I think it, as, a, as a kindergarten uh, student, I suppose, as a kid, I think that was my earliest in in actually in Johor Bahru in Malaysia. Um, I was 
I remember being at school and waiting for my mom to pick me up. Um, and it was one of those schools that was next to a convent. In those days, it was still very much, you know, you still see the sisters in the convent. And that was that was that was my earliest memory. I remember wearing this little pinafore, um, this little check pinafore. I was running around. It was very exciting at the time. Everything was very innocent and very pure. Um, was it a what type of school was it? It was a it was a I think it was a private kindergarten. I think you could say it's private. Um, and it was it was all kinds of different kids in there, um, and. It, there was um it was it was called the hilltop kindergarten it doesn't exist anymore um and and there were a lot of teachers local teachers and some foreign teachers i suppose and then you got kids from all walks of life and you know there were malaysian indians malaysian malays Malaysian chinese and and it was just yeah it was really quite extraordinary did, did you have nuns as teachers no no hilltop was the kindergarten didn't have as, as nuns but in when I went to primary school the next year, yes, I had nuns as teachers. Um, primary school in convent, uh, the convent uh, prim- primary school in Johor it's still there. Is no, there are no more nuns. Uh, they've left now. It's a national school, so um, it's very different now. But then they had chapels, and you had to go upstairs to you know do a prayer if you like to. You can do. You can talk to the sisters, and they were very lovely, and they were teachers, and they were um, mentors and counselors, and and the halls of the convent felt like you know a bit of a, a nunnery, I think, in a way, and it was very 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 sweet, very lovely. I, I must say that I'm currently sitting in Penang, <laughs> and on my feet are tiles that are made in Scotland. Oh, really? It's it's quite amazing when you think about it. This building was built in 1938. Wow. And somehow these tiles made its way all the way from Scotland. Mm. I'm always in awe. And I think the Scotsmen, their clans, and the Chinamen and their clans, there must be some kind of link. Oh, look, we're so similar. It's not, not funny, actually. It, it, it really is. I mean, we can talk about the East and the West, but really when it comes down to, you know, tribes and collectiveness and all that, it's very similar. Um, um, same, same, The same thing in Malaysia, there's so many clans and different groups of people with their identity and their, their practices. Um, and and that's, that's where the similarity is. And also, as you were saying that, you get these Scottish tiles. But, you know, Malaysia is like a big melting pot of everything you've got all the british influence you've got the local influences you've got the hockey and the Cantonese, malay chinese everything you know it's just all mixed in there but but the, the thing is it's so dense there's just so many layers like i'm sure you understand being in penang that you know some you know people speak hockey in there but in the center people speak cantonese and then for the south we speak hockey again but the hockey is different to the ones in the north and then the people who have arrived on the shores of Penang would be very different from the people who have arrived on the shores of Johor, for example. Mm-hmm. And their experience of the British rule would also be very different. I think in Penang, they are probably more, more sophisticated, perhaps. But the South, it's a bit different. Um, and then the relics and the rem- remnants and what's left behind in these places were all also very different. Some of them, I think in Johor, a lot of them, most of them is destroyed now. Uh, but I think in the north, it's still very well kept, as you can see under your feet. Um, and similarly, like in Malacca and in places where there are other influences that's not British, like the Portuguese influence, my word, there are still places when you can see that still standing. Such an extraordinary, you know, melting pot, I think. So Lynn, on that note, before you give us more interesting nuggets, <laughs> No worries. So, Lin Lui Hao Kong Hokkien Wawa. Eh, eh, hiya, tapi wai, wai, Hokkien Kalu e bo siyo sang ah. Wa chai lu e si sao te. Wa si sao, wa si Singapore e, lu si Pinang e. Lu tua chu lu gong kalu e maka tia, leo lu ge sisters, brothers uvo. Bawa lau pe lo. 
，我搞我老爸老母讲啦，顶摆咯，伊有得我搞伊家讲话，搞我阿妈讲咯，讲啊，好听话，是啊。Do your mother is from which part of China? Eh, my mother, my mother is Hokkien lang lah. So it's in Fujian province. Oh, but I don't know. 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 福建人咯，嗯。See when when you speak like that, it just feels like home. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> really? Yeah, I mean, but it's a different Hokkien. Yours is softer. Mine is a lot harder, sharper. But, but my my paternal grandma speaks like that. Does she really? Yeah, yeah. Oh wow, yeah. My yeah, my paternal grandmother definitely speaks like that. Yeah.、Uh, so my paternal grandma, I think, is from Anhui or something like that. Oh really, Anhui? Wow. Yeah. So, do I, you know where、yeah. your your side's from, or have you well, visited? No, I I understand it to be um Fujian province. Certainly, I think it's on the water. So Quanzhou or Xiamen, I don't know. Probably, I I haven't been able to trace it back. My cousins tell me that they reckon it's Quanzhou, but I'm not too sure. So, so if I were to ask you to go back to China, would you know where you could go back to? <laughs> not at all. <laughs> not even the slices. Not even a fraction. No idea. Is as foreign to me as you know Scotland is, for example. Really is. No clue. No, no, no sense. And and I'll be completely lost. I'll be you know. And they'll probably glare at me and going, ah, foreigners here.、Yeah. So no, no idea. But. Once, about three years ago, I was in Shenzhen. I must say,、uh-huh. I've never felt more at home. <laughs> Looks wise, right? <laughs> it, well, it's certainly very modern now. It is, you know, it's incredibly welcoming, Shenzhen. You know, it's 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 got that proximity to Hong Kong, so it's super modern and super open to expats and foreigners. So, yeah, it is. It is pretty cool, I have to say. Yeah. So, just to establish that.、Um, Motherland, or would you even call it motherland?、Um, for your mother on the maternal side? No, I actually don't see China as the motherland. Malaysia is the motherland. That's where I was born, and that's where my parents are from. I guess, but I suppose no. I think what you're saying is motherland, the land of origins.、Um, yeah, it is the origins of my my ancestors, I suppose. So my parents, both parents, are from there, and as far as I know, and so, but, but it's kind of confusing because there, it's not. I, it's very hard for me to say that's the motherland because none of my parents are from there originally. I mean, they were born in Malaysia, and and I don't know anybody from there because they were they passed they're long dead before I I was even born. So yeah. So it's a bit weird. May, may I ask the names of your family? Um. Yes.、Yeah, so, as in my parents, your mom, your mom, yeah, my your mom, dad, my dad, Dick Singh, my mom, Suli. So, yeah. And what was Suli like? Suli. Um. She's um. You know, I look a lot like her. So, you know, she was um a very, a very quiet person. She's. Um, fairly introvert, I think. She's not an extrovert.、Um, she's she's、uh, a lady, I suppose.、Um, she was、um, she raised four children.、Uh, she was a housewife for most of her life. You know, after getting married, I think that's pretty standard for a lot of Malaysian women. Well, not now, back then.、Um, yeah, I think you know my my mother was a, an excellent cook. Oh, she could cook. She was a chef. She could bake. She used to make those, tuo bao, you know, da bao, big,、oh, big, those huge, those huge, huge ones. Huge meat buns, yeah, absolutely, huge meat buns. Um, and and then she would make those by hand. She was a she was an excellent tailor. She she made all our clothes. She made a lot of our clothes, rather. You know, those the old Singer sewing machines. She would step on the thing and and make them. And you know, to to give us all clothes, and it was quite quite interesting. Yeah, in those days, people were still making clothes. 
So mum was um, Siu Li, and what was her surname? Ho. H-O, Ho? Yes. Oh, just like that famous comedian in Sydney now. <laughs> there is a famous comedian in Sydney with a surname you have You have to Google or Instagram her. Oh, wow. Okay, let me check it out. Definitely. I feel so, so I feel apologetic that I didn't know. Yes. <laughs> oh, must. You must. You must. It's uh, he, Huang, Ho. Ho. Is she from? She's originally from China. Ah, right. I'm going to have to check her out. Yes. I'll, I'll so share we, the link with you. Yeah. So, She's Ho amazing. is, yes, absolutely. So, Ho is her. Ho, I yes. believe. As is my tan is Chen, so yeah. So my mother was He Xiu Li, or so Xiu Chen. He Xiu Li, okay. Mm. Yes. And definitely. would you still keep in touch with her side of the family now? Oh, unfortunately, no. Um, my mom passed when I was young, and so a lot of that family connection sort of a bit weakened since then. So yeah, no, I don't actually, which is quite sad. Do you know who they are? Yeah, I. you know what? When I was a lot younger, like a little girl, I definitely, I met them all. Like there was there definitely two sisters, you know, in Johor at the time. Um, there were her parents who lived in Batu Pahat in Johor. And then, um, and also her brothers. There were definitely her brothers, but they're all spread across Malaysia. I don't even know where they are now, to be honest. Um, yeah, I met them. I, I've seen them and I've I've had a contact with them. I just, you know, I, I haven't seen them after my teens, really, after she passed. So, yeah. It was a, a difficult time. It was a difficult time. Um, I think it's very hard losing your mother when you're young, when you, as a teenager. Um, and it's it's hard to um, to really share the experiences of people who have mums all their lives, you know, who, who thought and how to you know, to pass down their cooking skills or teach them how to date or, you know, share their birthing experiences and all those things. So I don't really have that. I don't quite understand what that, what it is to have a mom in, in that department. So, yeah, it's very strange. Um, yeah. I, I, I would like to sort of expand on that about the women who came before me. So meaning the women who shaped me as I went. So you had your mother until your teenage life. Was there another mother figure or was she always there with you? Yeah, look, there was my grandmother, um, Amma, mm. who was, uh, she shaped was, a lot of my life. Yeah. What was Amma's name? Uh, oh, this is a gig up, gig up, your gig up. Yeah, that's the name. She was uh, born in the 1920s in Malaysia, kicked up, and she was, uh, she was a typical Malaysian uh, ama. You know, she was, uh, she dotes on you, she'll cook for you, she'll fuss around you, she'll tell you folklores and mythologies, and she tell you about those days when she was young and, you know, when she was in the jungle on the farm, and she'll tell you those stories and she'll tell you about all oh, the Japanese occupation and how it was a terrible time and yeah she would um to tell you all these little stories and she'll have these old you know you know old lady powder that she keeps in her handbag and then she'll have, she'll have she'll carry them around when she travels <laughs> she was um yeah she was she was she was in my life and and formed the part of my life because she she, she gave me those stories that I she formed a, a part of my heritage, you know, because she she gave me an insight into the 20s, 30s and 40s in Malaysia. And it, it gave me a sense of where I sort of have come from or the history of my my family uh, then. So, uh, yeah, so 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 she she gave me some insights. And also so the she she's also a, a fairly, you know, doting person. So. You know, she was fast and all that. So she it, it gave me, it taught me how to be a bit more doting, I suppose, nurturing in that sense, you know, to care for a young person, to care for them, to, to give them food, to buy them a little 
Glede or Kue Pisang or Pisang, you know, Goreng Pisang. Or you should come when she visits, she'll buy this little plastic bags of Malay Kue, you know, to come and visit, you know, or you know, you know that kind of thing. So, so for 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 me as a as a girl, you know, the the gift of food is a a sign of you know um a love and and care, you know. So for me, is food is important. If I'm feeding somebody, I care for them. So I think that forms a large part of my 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 life as a girl. Yes. So that's one person. Um, and there are other aunties and un I would say aunties and uncles, but aunties along the way. You know, neighbors, uh, aunties from other friends. And as in, even in Australia, there are Malaysian aunties and uncles, of mothers of of other friends who have, have sort of adopted you know, as part of, as like my, my mom, my pseudo mom, because they, they kind of remind me of those mom, the mom and my, my mom, sorry, the mom, my mom and grandmother at the time. Uh, and so you, it's, it's a comfort zone. It, it's a comfort thing. So it's, it's a comfort blanket to have those people around you. Yeah. So over the years, there have been a myriad uh, aunties and, 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 and people around me have for you know being part of my life as a as a as a girl as a woman and here we're talking about aunties that have no relation no blood relation. no relation yeah any aunties any malaysian singapore aunties are your aunties you know if you have a connection they're your mom <laughs> that kind of thing <laughs> so yeah i think i guess you're right so singapore malaysia would be motherland not china yeah no no it's it's remarkable how people will look at you and go Oh, you're Chinese, so oh, you must be from China, and then all the political issues will start coming out. But no, I, I have no inkling of China whatsoever. Um, all I know is ancestrally, I'm from there. That's it. Yeah, and you know, one of the reasons why we're doing this podcast is because uh, I had this idea to talk to 99 women, mm. and that we would each be sentinels of peace for the region. Mm. Yes. So we, 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 we come from stock that uh, from countries surrounding the South China Sea, nowhere else that we want peace more than in South China Sea. I mean, it's currently uh, 11 countries, I believe, that are surrounding mm. um, this area where there's an enormous amount of uh, oil and gas deposits so something like four yes, trillion and yes a lot of a lot of wealth a lot of resources correct would you have anything to share about this area and what's going on yeah there's a lot of disturbances of late obviously as you know with you know china advancing its interest in the area um and it's causing a lot of mayhem for everybody you know and of course a lot of it's political why is it causing mayhem because other people have interests there and when two interests collide, it becomes, you know, that it becomes a conflict. And there are also interests of countries that are not from that region, for example, the US, and that causes more conflict. Um, and so I think, yeah, so I think it's about growing powers. I mean, China is a growing power. There's no doubt about that. And 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 when powers grow, they want to advance and expand their their interests and their and what they own and what they have. And that's very natural. And so I think that's what's happening in the region. So it's it's like welcoming, welcoming. <laughs> it's like a new kid on the block. Then the cute new kid comes to school, and everyone's like, "Oh, who's this?" And they're disturbing, you know, the 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 model, the system, the setup of the place. And that's what's happening around there. And and all countries are cognizant of what's going on at the moment, um, especially the ones that are surrounding them. So. You know the Asian countries, ASEAN in particular, because ASEAN will form a large part of those eleven countries, and yeah, so so they're all very cognizant of what's going on. But and I think every country has a different way of dealing with it, um, uh, with what's happening. I went on Google Maps and zoomed into Spratly Islands. Yeah, it's quite interesting what you can find. <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> what. There's so many islands out there. You, for the first time, you realize, oh my word, South China Sea is just a, thousands and thousands of islands, and you wouldn't even know what these Spratly Islands are about. My word, you, you know, in Singapore, I went to Bintan recently, 
Bintan is like a four, an hour ride from Singapore, and that's Indonesia. So you you know it's 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 very easy to pop from one island to another, and you're actually popping from one country to 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 another. So yeah, tons of island. Actually, in the region, when you look at Indonesia, it's, it's huge. Oh I my mean, god! Fast Indonesia, spreading. Yeah, Indonesia has the most islands in the region, and then there's the Philippines after that. I mean, together they have you know. I think close to 20,000, I think, islands in the region. Um, that's a lot of islands. So Spratly Islands, the few scattered around there, that's the center of this conflict. Hmm, what are they again? Sorry, what's the fuss, what's the, what's the fuss about? You know, so yes, certainly. <laughs> it does surprise a lot of us. What do you think is like the best way forward? I mean, from your point of view, as a journalist who's been based in Hong Kong, seeing what things are going on, as a journalist who also has her foot very steadily in Australia, what do you think is the best way forward? Um, if I say compromise, um, I don't know if that's going to go down well for a lot of people, but I think ultimately in all relationships, it's about compromising and it's about agreeing to have different things. It's about sharing. Um, that's going to be very difficult for, you know, political reasons because, you know, that doesn't work. Sharing and compromise rarely works, I think. I mean, or they have in the past over treaties and, you know, when things become better, peacetime. Um, but I think you have to compromise. You have to accept that there are, there are different powers in the region now. You have to first accept that, that things have changed and it's no longer the Asia Pacific of yesteryears. Um, the powers that are there at the moment. And when I say the powers, mainly the US, because it's the biggest power in the region. And then, and I think it, it needs to, I think there needs to be a sense of, right, you're different, but we don't like that you're different. But how can we work with that difference is, is the key. Working with the difference is, I think, something politicians need to really understand and try to actually mm, come to terms with it. Coming to terms is key, I think, because there's a lot of non-acceptance of the rise of China, that people think that China shouldn't rise and, and it has no right to rise. It's, it's, a, it's a human rights abuser. There's no place in this world. And I think, I think that non-acceptance makes it very hard to move forward. When you accept that, then you, you can find ways to get around it and maybe work together. And by working together means you, you decide if you are arguing over a piece of land, you decide how you're going to split that up. If you want naval bases, you agree all together and, you know, both work, whichever the powers are there to agree to have where and how. And they also have to, most importantly, work with other, all the other countries in the region, the physical countries there. For example, China is far north, far north South China Sea, right? So, and the US is not even in the in South China Sea. And then there's a lot of the other countries that you need to talk to, like Vietnam and all these other Philippines countries that are actually in the region. Um, and you have to work out a way to accept the, the fact and then split it up or, you know, meet in the middle, compromise somehow or other. It, it, it sounds really simple, but it isn't. I, I'm, I'm being very, very general about it. That's how you I focus. Think. Do you yeah. focus a lot of your journalistic life on this topic? Yeah, unfortunately, because I to write about economics and um, trade, you'll have to talk about the geopolitics, unfortunately. Yes. So there's always a mention of that. So if there's a tension in trade or tension in business between countries, it's always a geopolitical reason why they're upset, why they're angry, why they're fighting, that kind of thing. So, yes, it's always a, it's, it's front and center of everything. But. I don't report on the Spratly Islands specifically or the defense around it or the arms and all the ownership. You know, that's not really my thing, but certainly it does come up. Are you working on anything in particular right now? Not at the moment? No, because uh, mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm taking a little break. <laughs> okay. And what do you do when you're on a break? <laughs> not do read we? the news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I the news can be stressful, very stressful. Not read the news. I I'm a I'm a beach bum. I'm a huge beach person. I swim. I go to the I enjoy the sun. 
I, I really do like that. And um and and certainly I see my uh friends. I I have a glass of wine. I do. I'm a big wine drinker. It's terrible, everyone knows that. Aussie, Aussie wine? Yeah, oh, any wine for that matter, anything that's good. <laughs> Sorry, but I think it, I think the wine thing is definitely very Aussie. That's the Aussie root. But I can drink I drink any other kinds of wine. But certainly when I'm back home in Sydney, it's nice to drink local wines. And especially in summer now, uh, you drink wine and you sit by the beach and you enjoy the, the aesthetic beauty of Australia. Um, I think that's one of the nicest things about being home. So, so Lynn, if I were to throw a stone at you suddenly and surprise you and say, hey, so Lynn, where are you from, mate? <laughs> well, I'll say I'm from Sydney. Okay. Sydney. That's what I'll say. Yeah. It depends on the context of the situation. I, people ask, people on the street ask me here in Australia, I'll say I'm from Sydney. If people overseas ask me where I'm from, I still say I'm from Sydney and Australia. And then, you know, they might, if the conversation continues, I'll explain my, my background and especially in Singapore, huh, here's an interesting bit for you. In Singapore, yeah. I have a bit of a mixed identity because I'm going back to my, my, in my early years. So there's a lot of Singaporean in me, a lot of Malaysian in me. And, and I guess when I'm there, people think I'm from there. I can still speak all the colloquial and, you know, the bits and all the local languages and, and the Singlish and all that. So, so people will say, Oh, you're, 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 are you, you're from here, right? I'm like, yeah, but I'm not. And it's, there's a whole 30 odd years that's transpired in between then and now. And so it, it's, it's quite, it's quite bizarre. So in, in Asia, in Singapore, I'll say, yes, I'm from Australia, but I'm also from here. Then they go, ah, I understand what you mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got it. I got it. And then of course, depending on who it is, it actually then, then, then meanders into a local discussion, a full Singlish with the Hokkien and the Malay and the English and the everything that's just thrown in there. And anyone who's on the outside would go, what are you saying? <laughs> and so, yeah, so it's extraordinary. So uh, the last seven months, eight months of my life has been a bit of a, re a, a, a an awakening, a, a return to roots type thing. Quite extraordinary, actually. Yeah. Would you like to sort of share a little bit more about how you intend to wrap up this career as a journalist? What's, what is that end goal? Is it like an award? <laughs> or is it like <laughs> you know coming up as an independent publisher yourself I don't know it's a very good question I uh I don't I I've been thinking about next the last phase of my life it sounds very macabre but um you think about how you want to end end it all <laughs> to finish it with a bang perhaps um but journalistically I think it'd be nice to do uh to go beyond print and do more multimedia, TV, you know, sound, podcasts, and expand into the real digital world of journalism. You know, we sh digital journalism has been such an intrusion into, you know, journalism per se. But I think instead of just focusing on the, the surface shallow side of digital journalism, you know, the clickbaits and the popular, the viral stuff, there's a lot of digital journalism that hasn't been really explored like you know using sound you know for stories and and vision for stories so maybe I like to do more on, on that in the next few years of my life how it ends I, I actually really don't know I'll be honest um of late has been a bit of big unknown especially with the turbulence of the last three years um I don't I don't know how it will be and where I will be actually to be honest I don't even know if it will be journalism forever. And, and that's a question I'm starting to ask myself now. I, I'm, 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 a, I'm an accountant by training and I'm, I've, I've got a business background. Maybe I'll fear into something else. Or maybe I'll just, you know, run an Airbnb quietly somewhere. And um, I recently met a couple in Indonesia and they, they bought a, a, a beach resort in, with the intention of actually have, being a, an animal, animal shelter. And then because friends started coming to live there, they started to expand little, you know, build little villas on the, on the beach. And suddenly now it's this cool semi-Mediterranean type resort. And that's their retirement plan. Maybe I'll do that. I don't know. Maybe somewhere. And then you'll be right in the middle of the South China Sea. Oh, yes. And maybe I will have one of those in the middle of one of, on one of the islands on, in South China Sea. How ironic that would be, you know, and that would be very interesting. Um, perhaps that would be it. Perhaps it'd be something else, but you know, it, it's occurred to me that 
an island lifestyle in Asia could well be a possibility given my return to roots and also that the fact that we have, you know, Asia or South, a South China Sea Islands are, are amazing, beautiful. Um, and so, yeah, so how, I, I don't really know how it all end up, um, but uh, I'll keep going and I'll let you know, you know, if you ask me if, in a few years, perhaps. Um, how that Sorry, goes. I didn't mean to make it sound. No, so it's okay. Calm. But no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 it's a really difficult question to answer, I feel. Um, okay. It keeps changing. It just keeps changing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've got 10 minutes left on this free, and I really wouldn't want to keep you any longer, Sulin. I, I really, really thank you for being so candid no, and it's okay. so thank open. You. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I, I like to share more of my, of my, I like sharing this part of my life as a Southeast Asian Australian, um, you know, openly, because I think when you do talk about it, people identify with it, whether that may yes. be a convent school or, you know, an old style kampong house or, you know, whether it's tiles under your feet or whether that's, you know, one of your uncles is half British or, you know, your aunt is from Portugal or wherever else. It's very, very interesting. And the food we eat, how we live our lives, you know, how, Parents fetch you to school and they take you back from school. The yellow buses, the public buses, the 50 cents, you know, the, the sweeties that you buy from the sundry shop. And I like I like to share all those things because that is an insight into, for Australians, the migrant lives, migrants, you know, who come to Australia. But also, generally speaking, it, it, when you articulate these things, it brings back a certain memory that, you know, you can't really understand because it's all in your head. But when someone says it out loud, it, it, it really brings a certain feeling to you, you know, when you talk hockey into each other, for example. It's quite quite funny, quite quite cool. Quite it funny. was pretty cool. Ah, exactly. So I think that's really nice. Yeah. So I it's it's tradition to end the interview with a piece that you would read ah, yes. so so that we can record your voice reading it. It could be something you wrote, it could be something factual or something creative, but I understand you've got an AFR article you like to share. Yeah, I, I picked that one because it was written after Lee Kuan Yew died and we were doing you know, several pieces to commemorate that very historical moment. And I wrote a little bit about my childhood as a young person, you know, crossing you know, the, the causeway to go to school in Singapore. I'll just read three parts and keep it simple. I mean, it's not the cool. end of the story, but it's the start of the story rather. And I'll give you a sense of what happened, you know, in those days, you know, as a, when I was a little girl. So, yeah. When you're ready. Okay. The date was April 2nd, 2015. The title is, In Singapore, Education Was Valued Above Everything Else, It Still Is. Kilometres of orange-coloured school buses queued to, to clear immigration into Singapore, crossing the causeway, the bridge linking Malaysia and the island state, in the pre-dawn hours, it was a daily sight. Drowsy children, this writer was one of them in the 1980s, would march across flower-lit halls with passports in their hands, waiting for officers to wave them from one country into another, all for one purpose, school. Buses would travel three to four hours starting at about 4 a.m. to pick up students across Johor Bahru, the southernmost city, of Malaysia and take them to schools throughout Singapore, but mostly to Woodlands, the northernmost township of the Republic. For some kids, the travel alone was a round trip of seven hours. That's really it. That's the first three bars. Wow. And you did that every day. Yeah. Yeah, every and, day. And so did Ronnie oh. Chiang, I remember. <laughs> did he really? Oh, yes, he was a JB boy. That's right. Yes, he did. Yes. Yes, he did. He was. It, it's funny. He's a JB boy, so he did that, and and yeah, a lot of us did. It, it's a sea of children, sea of students. Extraordinary. It's quite a sight, and it's very dark because it's about four or five a.m. So it's very dark, and you can still hear the cockles crowing just then and, and, and at the time. And you know, it's like you know the coo -coo 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 -coo! and then maybe the mosque prayers might come on, and then. The sound of the buses, rah, and then and then suddenly, you know, you got you know the children chattering, and then people talking on the bus, and nah, 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 and then the auntie would go sit down, sit down, you know, like you know, and then all in Chinese or 坐下来, 坐下来, 
快点，快点，快点，快点，去去去去去，挂挂那边啊，我等你那边啊，等你啊。Okay, so to say, you know, wait for you on the other side, and、um, yeah. Okay, 快点上上上上，走了走了走了 ，you know, and、uh, let's go. So and just, it just brought me to that moment, that Woodlands checkpoint. The Woodlands checkpoint, and most of them, of course, the aunties and uncles, the drivers, a lot of them speak Mandarin, and you know, and and they were like, oh, oh, 快点上车上车上车。不要等啊！那么多人，快点上车啊！我们走了。And then the kids will get off, and then they will scoot off, and then and then all you know they will drive across, and they will drop them off to the schools, and everybody will rush off, and then they will start all over again. Sometimes if you don't want to get on the bus from school, some of us will walk to the immigration and have a little ice kacang or a cheng tung or a, a snack at the Woodland Center food center. And then you're like, oh, and then and then the kids will then cross over and they wait on the other side for the bus to turn up. They'll time it so that they know their bus will be there at the time. They'll be like, oh, you're on the bus. I just didn't see you in school. Oh, I went to that place to eat something. And then and then the and then the the the, the, the driver will get say, oh, come on, come on. Today, many people. Come on, come on. And then you have to share seats with each other. <laughs> And then he will drive across, and they will drop you off home again. And then it starts all over again the next day. Yeah, that's it. What an effort、Maybe、for、fun. school! For school, yeah, and it's hot. Don't forget, it's bloody humid, as you know. So yeah, not a not an easy easy commute. And it's it's it starts at crack of dawn, and it goes on all day. Sometimes if you have extracurricular activities, it goes on till four or five in the afternoon. You're not home till about seven a.m. and eight a.m. in the night. And you know, and then you start again at four o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning. That's so、amazing. yeah, that's that's really that's what brought the citizen of the world out of you. <laughs> Maybe perhaps it's so it's so generic, it's so local, it's so raw, it's so it's so something it, you you don't see in Australia. And I think it's yeah, it's as I, if I, Australia and New Zealand were connected by a bridge, bridge. and yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> People would cross、much. that bridge to go to school every day. Correct, and it's um yeah exactly. And you have to carry a passport, and obviously the conditions aren't like you know in Australia. It, it's a it's a you know at the time in the eighties it was a developing you know Malaysia is super developing, and so is Singapore, and so you know roads are bumpy and holy. There are potholes everywhere, and buses are rudimentary. And you know, you know, it's not it's just pollution everywhere. It's not it's not like oh, it's walk in the park. No, it's not like that at all. It's a it's a big hike, big hike, big travel. So, so how do people follow you? Do you have a website or do you tweet? Yeah, I have a Twitter account. I haven't tweeted very much in in recent years. You definitely go there. That'll be a good one.、Um, What is it?、Fun. It's at Sulin underscore Tan. And it's spelt S U L I N underscore T A N. So that's you on Twitter. Yeah. You've been listening to Jasmine Lowe's Audio Journey Experience, an AFT podcast production. Subscribe to the podcast on your preferred platform, and if you'd like to encourage us on, find out how you can support the production by visiting https: listen by heart. dot web projects w e b p r o j x dot com <music>